Welcome in to the best in paranormal podcasting. This is Darkness Radio. I'm your host, Tim Dennis. I'm excited for today's show. We're talking a subject that we normally don't talk about on the show. Why, I don't know, because this is a fascinating subject, one that may be slightly controversial. Uh, it does deal with the world of ufology it, in, in a roundabout way. We're talking crop circles today. And whether they're man-made or whether they truly are supernatural and come from a different source, does it come from a UFO? Does it come from a being, a supernatural being? Does it come from, because we do deal with it a lot in Europe, uh, the land of the fae folk, fairies, or maybe another being? We'll talk about that today with our guest, Ellie Marzuli, who has a brand new project out there, a brand new documentary I had the pleasure of seeing this uh, past weekend and got a chance to sit down and uh, see. We'll talk about that here in just a moment. The uh, name of the picture is uh, Crop Circles, Exposing the Secret Language of the Dragon. We'll talk about that, what that secret language is exactly uh, here during the program. Just a little bit about L.A. before we get to him here in just a moment. He put it eloquently himself. 13 pictures, 25 books is is a great way of putting it, but there's a little bit more here to L.A. Uh, he's an author, lecturer, filmmaker. He's penned eight books, including the Nephilim trilogy. There's more than that, of course, which make up the CBA bestsellers list. He's received an honorary doctorate for the series from his mentor, Dr. I.D.E. Thomas, who was the provost at Pacific International University. His book on the trail of the Nephilim, Definitive Proof of Biblical Giants, is a full-color, oversized book which uncovers the startling evidence that there has been a massive cover-up of what he believes are the remains of the Nephilim. That's going to come into this discussion today. Uh, the giants mentioned in the Bible. He has taken on the trail of the Nephilim and created a film series that continues his research with interviews from people in their specific field of knowledge. Where the book left off, L.A. continues his research and is on the trail. Let's talk about crop circles with our guest today, L.A. Marzuli. L.A., thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, Tim, thanks for having me on. It's, it's 13 books, 25 films. Just to oh, I'm sorry, I got it mixed 13 up. Books, Thir 13, no books, 13 books, 25, books, 25 films. 25 films. <laughs> All right. You're more visual than, 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 uh, than Paige, but that's okay. All right. 13 books, 25 films. My apologies. Uh, first of all, very good work with the film. I, I enjoyed it thoroughly. I want to talk, first of all, about the, the skepticism behind crop circles why is it we are so wanting to and it's got a rich history a long history going back to the 1600s why is it that we want to basically and, and forgive me for the language i'm going to be a little gruff here i've been watching hockey all weekend i've been at my nephew's hockey games why is it that we want to be so gruff and crap all over crop circles right away why is it that this seems to be the evidence that we want to be so skeptical about Human beings, I think, by and large, most human beings, and I'm painting with a very broad brush here, most people don't want to have anything to do with the supernatural, don't want to have it invade their life. Um, they just, you know, and, and when you think about it, I mean, most Americans, uh, especially now, you know, it's like, it's like work, trying to get ahead, trying to stay ahead. If they got kids, it's like college and this and that and soccer moms. I mean, you know, no one has time for this. I do. Mm -hmm. I've been checking this stuff forever. Mm -hmm. That's where books in the 25 films come from um i head up to montana tomorrow i gotta get up at three in the morning to catch a seven seven a.m flight out of lax and we're going up there to interview several people um about roswell and i think yeah it's going to be great that's number um that'll be number seven in the ongoing ufo series number six is in post-production but look i have i i have close friends who just go like mm -hmm. they don't want to hear it they don't want to look at it. They don't want to see it. And basically, it's a head in the sand mentality is what it is. If it's not in my if it's not in my front door, I don't need to know about it. Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a biblical literalist. And what people don't get, if you take the supernatural out of this book, yeah, you, there's nothing left. I mean, you got you got some genealogy and that's about it. Right. I call it the Bible, the guidebook of the supernatural, because really, that's what it is. It tells us who we're interfacing with, what to interface, how to how to block them, how to stop them, how to put on the armor. I mean, it's all this stuff. It's all there. Mm -hmm. Most people have no idea. And certain churches never, never cross that line and get into it. So there's a prophecy, my people perish for lack of knowledge, and people perish for lack of knowledge because, because they're not 
they, they don't even know what what's out there. Look, Ephesians 6 tells us this. Put on the armor of God because our enemies are not flesh and blood. Now I'm paraphrasing here. But what we're fighting against is not flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. They are principalities. They are powers. They are our cones. They are um, these wickedness in heavenly places. And it all goes back to the idea, the concept, that we are in some sort of a cosmic war. Well, what do you mean by that, L.A.? Well, crop circles are part of the cos cosmic war. The UFO abduction phenomena, part of the cosmic war. The cat and mouse, what we see with the whole UFO phenomena, part of the cosmic war. The cattle mutilations, part of the, cat um, part of the cosmic war. That is number six in our ongoing film. I'm in post-production on that, okay. Tim, by the way. We'll okay. probably have that out by the end of June. Uh, it's not for the faint of heart. I remember back in the 90s when Linda Moulton Howe released her film, Strange Harvest. Uh, I was watching maybe 10 minutes at a time, and I go, I can't look at this click. I was. That's over 30 years ago now. Whoa. That's film. I was having trouble with it, and, and most people will. With the Nephilim, the same thing. You know, when you start looking at, wait a minute, you know, giants? Come on now. But the deeper you go, the more everything just connects, like it dovetails together, it links together. So I just think it's um, people don't want to deal with it because it's not knocking on their front door, but it is because Fox News, CNN, and all the major networks have stated that UAPs, i.e. UFOs, are real. So in my opinion, it's the same entities. It's a cat and mouse game. The crop circles are there. There are hoaxes. I get that. But that's why our film does a deep dive and i want to thank jeffrey wilson for letting us use the footage we paid him for it but he still he didn't have to let us use it right but he let us use it, uh, of the chillicothe crop circle which is in a field of eight foot corn you can't make a crop circle in in corn that's eight feet tall can't mm -hmm. do it mm -hmm. now it, before we get to chillicothe because i want to talk about that as well um i want to rewind a little bit because you said some interesting stuff here i want to go back to the church and i want to talk about the church specifically because and and i'm going to tie this into the government i want to tie this into disclosure real quick i know nothing's real quick about this discussion uh as we sit here and talk about the arrow uh meetings we just recently had another one on on capitol hill they sit and talk about uh, and i think we were uh, fed a little bit by mr kirkpatrick but they they talk about well we have a certain amount of videos that have been put out there but the U.S. Navy, I know I'm talking in circles now. The U.S. Navy has now said no more videos. They're not releasing any more videos. Now, supposedly, the reason being is that top secret tech is being put out that we have with these videos. So that's why no more videos. But it could be argued that there's more things in these videos than they're willing to let go in these videos that we may be seeing. So there's some interesting things coming up here, L.A., as far as no more videos. But now the government, on one hand, is saying too much stuff in the videos. We don't know if we want to let you see them. On the other hand, well, no, guys, come on. you got to help us solve the problem here. We don't know what the, all this stuff is. We're nice and naive. We're the government. We don't know what's going on here, right? It, does this seem ridiculous to you? It's, it's, it's kabuki theater. I mean, this way is just total nonsense. Um, there is a shadow government, in my opinion. They know exactly the insiders, not the congressmen, not the senators, although there might be a few that have been brought in. Most of them, it's kabuki theater. They get up there, no, no, we need to get to the bottom. Blah, 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 blah. Bob Lazar worked at S4 in the 90s. He was back engineering the propulsion system from a craft. People didn't believe him. I know the late Stanton Freeman, and he's not here to defend himself, but mm -hmm. the late Stanton Freeman didn't believe, believe Lazar. I've always believed Lazar. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do a film on him, but the other guy got it instead of me. I wanted to you know, bring him the light, and and because I've always believed Lazar. I actually interviewed him way back in the 90s. He showed up at the Little Alien where it was that first UFO conference with um, Gary Schwartz and uh, Norio Hayakawa. This is like 94, 95. So it's a long time ago. It's coming up on 30 years for crying out loud. You yeah. know, that's unbelievable, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, Lazar was there and I was asking him questions and he was, he was just real straight ahead. I've always believed him. There is a shadow government. There is a, a quid pro quo with our government and, and, and elements of it, 
with these entities. We'll just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Congressmen, it's very compartmentalized. Senators, congressmen, it's a need to know basis. Um, I'm in communication with a gentleman who is in one of the alphabet agencies. And, you know, he's there's nothing he's not releasing any top secret information to me. Don't get me wrong. What he is saying is that nobody knows. And, and his higher ups, nobody knows mm-hmm. what's going on. So okay. he's tapping me. Well, what's your take on an L.A.? And I'm telling him these are in, extra extra dimensional or interdimensional entities which are flying in and out of our space time continuum. They can manipulate space, time, matter and energy. The, they've already a quid pro quo. There was an agreement probably with Eisenhower at Holloman Air Force Base decades ago. Roswell was a real crash. It was not a weather balloon. That's why we're we're going up to Montana, because we want to we want to bring this and make sure that we bring this to light. Jesse Marcel was a patsy, no doubt about it. He was set up. He was totally set up. And since then, it has been this deliberate obfuscation. But the powers that be are rolling it out. And there's a lot of infighting in certain segments of the government like you say we're not releasing any more videos well oh yes you are you know and we'll see where this goes i predict that at some point at some point tim and i think i think it's going to be sooner than later they're going to come clean on roswell what i mean by that somebody retired general or active major or whatever some some guy will roll out like like luis elizondo but it won't be elizondo i don't think it won't be christopher mel it'll be somebody different somebody maybe we haven't seen before and he'll come out and he'll go okay you know we've got uh we're releasing it for american people because we think they have a right to know Mm -hmm. and maybe it'll happen when we get you know maybe like there's a ufo flap someplace like maybe over ukraine yeah. Right. Yeah. Where the cameras are there. This this mothership appears and we go, oh my god, and then it disappears. So at that point, and this is all speculation. I'm just I'm just running with it. It could happen in a myriad of ways. Right. The bottom is this guy will come on some news. It won't be Fox anymore because Tucker's no longer there. But it'll be some you know mainstream news media, and you'll be going. Well, we want to set the record straight with what happened at Roswell because the people that did that. You know, 40 years ago or actually 40 years, 70 years ago and longer are, are no longer in power. So so we, we want to set the record straight and they're going to show the film. They're going to show the colored film, you know, full color film. Here's the crash. Here's the debris field. We're taking the bodies out. We're doing all this stuff. They're going to show it and everybody's going to go. Who cares? Because that's what they're already doing. Yeah. Most people. I mean, nobody cares when I say nobody. Very few people care. And one of the things which we're doing with our film series is to try to educate people to what's going on. Now, because we're only recording audio right now, we got to tell people what you're holding up. You held up a, a newspaper that said General Ramey empties alien saucer. That was the first thing you held up. The, la- the, the second thing you held up, UFO disclosure video. Correct. Those are our films, or now you can get five of them. You can have instant gratification after the interview is over. Streaming that net. Streaming for like five bucks, less than a, a Starbucks coffee for crying out loud. You can be educated about all this stuff. Number four is on the abduction phenomena, and that film is chilling because we sit down with four people who have been taken, three of them from a very, very early age. We're talking five, six years old. Oh, wow. It's, it's very intense. That is intense. Um, now, I, I want to, again, address another point you brought up in the very beginning of the program. That is that the church has always had this knowledge of, of how to uh, defeat this enemy, so to speak, from, from space. Um, but that that knowledge can be lost. Now, being a good Catholic boy, no one ever sat down with me in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in catechism or anything else and said, well, Tim, uh, you know, while you're lighting candles uh, as, an, as a good altar boy, by the way, here's the armor you need in order to fight, uh, to fight aliens. Um, never came up once. Father never brought it up with me. Um, why is it that the ancient knowledge doesn't seem to be taught in church, is this is this a thing that that one it, they've been ashamed of for quite some time and and don't want to bring up? And two, would it ever be brought up if something like disclosure came out through the government? 
I spoke at Calvary, uh, Calvary Church down in Jupiter about a month, three weeks, four weeks ago, mm -hmm. whatever. And um, it was, the place was packed on a Friday night, upwards of 800 people. I spoke Saturday morning and Saturday afternoon to about 450 people on each session because unfortunately they forgot to tell people that it wasn't the same presentation three times. I was building something and there were, there were four different presentations. Oh, wow. The Friday night was a primer. Saturday morning was the Fatima deal, deep dive on Fatima, what it was, what it isn't. Then we went into the crop circle thing and I saved the best for last on the abduction phenomenon and what's manifesting now. That was a mind blower. And if I had started with that on Friday night, people would have just run out of the room screaming because you can't, you can't go there with people who are, don't understand what this is. Mm -hmm on their YouTube channel, and I say this with all due respect, like many churches, they get four or 500 views on their YouTube channel with, with the Sunday sermon, whatever. That's fine. They've already had 124,000 views. 124,000 views. Oh. People are waking up, Tim. They are waking up. And it's not only that I was raised Catholic, too. I was an altar boy. None of this was ever taught. The Catholic Church... When Augustine came in and reworked everything and everything changes, and I'm just not bagging on Catholics. It's the same thing in, in um, a lot of the evangelical circles, same thing. You know, people, there's one guy, I won't mention his name, but for years he's poo-pooed the UFO phenomena. Mm -hmm. But now that it's out, now all of a sudden he's an expert, you know, and he's he's telling people about it. And it's really annoying to someone like me who's been in the wings and been called every name in the book, you know, yeah, he's a kook, you know, blah, 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 blah. Why are you doing that? You know, you should be speaking about salvation. Salvation is the sh shallow end of the pool. Salvation is when we come to faith. You know, it's the shallow end. Yeah. We know nothing about the guidebook for the most part. We never studied it, never looked at it. Because in order to study the guidebook, you need to be born again, spirit filled. Mm -hmm. Have to. That's the key that opens the book. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just, you know, I don't know. If I have Remember, it's, I'm on LSD. I'm like 18 years old and I'm, I'm reading the book of Revelation. I have no idea what I'm reading. You know, the words are like floating off the page. That's a long time ago. Yeah. Very right. No idea. But the moment we're spirit filled, all of a sudden that book begins to open up and the spirit of a living God begins to show us how it, and Chuck Messler used to say it's an integrated message system. But the key which lets that frequency into us is the Holy Spirit, Spirit of a living God. And the key to that is being born against spirit filled. So the churches shy away from it, just like they shy away from a Nephilim. But salvation is the shallow end of the pool. Moving into the deep end of the pool is what's going on. What, what are we really looking at? And everything hinges on Genesis 3.15. This is how I start my, my presentations mm -hmm. to people. In Genesis 3.15, you have the pre-incarnate Christ in the garden. Adam and Eve have just sided with the dragon. They've been deceived, and, and their DNA has changed. They've sided with the dragon. And Jesus says to the dragon, guess what? Your seed, your offspring, will be at war and enmity, at war and enmity between your seed and the seed of the woman. The proto-evangelium, the seed of the woman, the one coming from the woman, will crush your head, you'll bruise his heel. That's the entire guidebook of a supernatural, i.e. the Bible. If we don't understand Genesis 3.15, then when we get to Genesis 6, we have no idea what's going on. When we get to the Tower of Babel, why is that happening? When we get to Abraham and the four kings, we're scratching our heads. When we get to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, we go, oh my God, this is kind of the Old Testament, run for your life, you know, ah! And finally, when we get to the conquest of Canaan, it's like, I can't, I can't, I remember taking the book and almost going, I can't do this throwing it against the wall, and I didn't read the Old Testament at all. For probably a month after that, I just put a bookmarker, and I kept reading the New Testament, because there's no way Jesus and this guy in the Old Testament are the same. They can't possibly be the same. We're looking at two different gods. I don't understand it. You know, hallelujah, Lord, but Jesus, I'm just going there. And it wouldn't be, I mean, I, you know, I, I, this was like 30 years old, so for 10 years, I'm wrestling with this. Wondering about the days of Noah, wondering about the conquest of Canaan. Finally, I read Dr. I.D.E. Thomas's book, The Omega Conspiracy, and that changed my life. 
that changed my life. He answered all the questions. And I got my honorary doctorate from him. He became a mentor to me. He's passed away. I think if he were alive today and he could see what we've done on the, his, his book as a springboard, he'd be blown away. He'd be absolutely blown away with On the Trail of a Nephilim, all the films that we've done, um, the UFO series, which which goes back to what he talked about. But, you know, Dr. Thomas was a pioneer. And this goes back into the 70s. So what we do, we're in the deep end of the pool. Mm -hmm. We're talking about putting on the armor of God, how to, how, to, how to protect ourselves from this. We're shouting out a clarion warning of what not only is coming, what is here, but what is about to be revealed. And we're saying it our priori. We're saying this is the coming great deception that the Bible speaks of. God sends them strong delusion because they did not believe the truth. Here's the truth, that Jesus created all things. He spoke everything into existence. Without him, nothing that was not made that was made. He's before all things. He holds all things together. I mean, we can believe that, or we can believe the ridiculous theory of Darwin, where somehow over millions of years of mindless evolution, you get a reproductive system. Time out, time out, wait a second. Wait a second, time out. So if you have a if you so if there's no reproduction system, hmm, then how are these entities reproducing? Oh, don't don't bother me with the facts, y'all. It, it just happened. Shut up and you know, just shut up and go away. And and this is what we we get. You know, we we've actually uh, with the elongated skulls in Peru, we did a DNA testing. Well, the academics don't like that mm -hmm. because it goes against what they believe and shows that 3,500 years ago, there was an influx of people from the Middle East, which, by the way, dovetails perfectly with our hypothesis that when Joshua and Caleb pressed the conquest of the Promised Land, these Nephilim tribes fled for their lives. Some of them, and it might be the Horites, fled to Paracas because our DNA evidence showed that the mitochondrial DNA coming from the female line came from the Middle East, Eastern Europe. That rewrites history. They don't want to rewrite history. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's a straw man argument. Oh, it's all contaminated, blah, 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 blah. No, it's not. You know, if it was all contaminated, then why didn't we get nuclear DNA? Why didn't my DNA show up? It didn't. And when you look at the films and the protocols, how careful we were, we took a skull and we, we took a, a Dremel tool and turned the skull upside down. And the foramen magnum, we scraped off the outer layer. Then we took compressed air and sprayed that. Then we went and took fresh genetic material. And that fell into a paper, a piece of paper, folded the paper, put it in a vial, flagged and tagged that thing, done. Now, where's the contaminant? And we're all in lab suits. Yeah. We've got you can see of me is like this, my eyes. That's it. I've got I've got a hood on, I've got a mask on, I've got gloves on, I've got double sleeves on, full body suit, head to toe, and boots. Give me a break. You know, just give me a break. You guys go down there and you take some samples. Of course, no one does that. No. no. So, you know, it's the deep end of the pool. That's what we do. I've lost friends over this. I mean, friends that I've known for like, you know, 20, 25 years. Well, you know, I don't know why you're doing that, LA. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to a conference where you're showing these elongated skulls because it proves the genetic manipulation that we read about in Genesis six, the seed war in Genesis three fifteen. Aye, aye, aye. <laughs> I, I sense a little bit of frustration here, LA. It may be me, I don't know, but I, I sense just a little bit. Uh, I tell you what, let's take a break. When we come back, let's talk a little bit about the Nephilim and what's at Wilshire and what's at Chili Coffee. And I, I, I wondered, I have a question about these, these mounds that are there. And is it the Nephilim or I had another hypothesis that I'm going to throw your way and could it be something else? And I know, I know what you're going to say. But I want to throw a hypothesis at you anyways. We'll do that after the break. Our guest is L.A. Marzulli. Again, lamarzulli.net. A lot of the stuff we're talking about is there. The The movies are there. 25 movies, right? 25 movies, 13 books? Okay. When we come back, L.A. Marzulli. We'll talk about those mounds that sit right near these crop circles. We'll talk more about crop circles when we come back right here on the Best in Paranormal Programming. This is Darkness Radio.
Welcome back to the Best in Paranormal Podcasting. This is Darkness Radio. Our guest is Ellie Marzuli. There is a brand new documentary out there that we want you to check out. And the name of the documentary is Crop Circles, Exposing the Secret Language of the Dragon. And we kind of elaborated what that dragon may be. We'll, uh, we'll uh, elaborate a little bit more here in the second half of the program. L.A., before the, pro, uh, before the break, I, uh, I told you we'd talk a little, start to get into crop circles a little bit more. At each of these crop circles, there is a huge mound at, at each of these crop circles. We talked about uh, Chillicothe, uh, Ohio. We, we started to talk a little bit about Wiltshire in England. Uh-huh. Uh, huge mounds, and you were mentioning the Nephilim. And that it's, uh, it's your belief that these are actually Nephilim grave sites? Correct? Yeah. Okay. Or essentially, is that a spoiler if I say that? Should I? No, 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 not at all. Okay. I mean, that's that's what I think that they are. Okay. Um, now, should we save it for the movie as to as to whether, as to why you believe that that is or? No, I mean, it, we, we, it's a spoiler alert because, I, you know, kind of when you go to Chillicothe, but, but what we see, um, not only in England, but over here, is that there's a connection. There seems to be a connection between these ancient megalithic sites, these these Silbury Hill, huge mm-hmm. mound. And if I took an archaeologist and blindfolded him and just transported him there and I said, where do you think you are? He'd probably go, oh, this looks like the mounds in Ohio. Mm-hmm. Looks exactly like them. Yeah. It's the mound builders. But of course, to the archaeologist, there's absolutely no connection between these blah, 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 blah. Because they're anti-supernaturalists and they don't believe that there's any... Uh, connection that they didn't that they didn't come over here they came over here the amorites were all over the united states the work of fritz zimmerman um, mm-hmm. a good friend of mine america stonehenge same thing uh, nephilim site they're everywhere they're all over the americas uh, the serpent mound nephilim site the octagon mound nephilim site we are looking at a hidden history that's been deliberately obfuscated from the peoples of the world. And the modern day archaeologists and anthropologists insist that, oh, these were all done by Native Americans. Well, the Native Americans have nothing in their oral tradition. Now, that's being changed because the Native Americans now go, oh, gee, if we're not the First Nation and we didn't build these, then we're not First Nation. That's what's at stake. Okay. So truth, in my opinion, is being thrown to the street. Um, the oral tradition... When you go back, when the first white settlers pressed into Ohio and they said, who built these? The tribes that were there just said, we don't know. It was here when we got here. So who do we want to believe? I mean, that's all written. It's all down there. Yeah. Nine foot, 10 foot, 12 foot skeletons were unearthed. Those those are not Native Americans. Elongated skulls. That's not. Look, I discovered. A, a nine footer out in Catalina, Iowa, mm-hmm. a picture of a nine footer. We had that picture analyzed by three different people. I was never supposed to see that. The really? former curator was fired after they let me in. Really? Now, that's what was he really fired for? We may never know. Okay. But shortly after I released the book, the man was fired. Hmm. We found six fingers. We found elongated skulls, and the one picture that went viral, absolutely went viral, was of Ralph Glidden standing in a recently excavated grave, and in front of him was a very large skeleton. That that was we used that on the Vieira brothers in search of a lost giants on the History Channel for their finale. They only did one season, yeah. So we showed it to them, and that was the climax of their of their series. My work. Jim's a good friend. I've never met him face to face, but we just did a a video together and I consider him a good friend, but they used my work um, because there was a nine footer there. So we know that they're there. Um, We've got the historical records that, that show it and talk about it, but the modern archeologists, not all of them. And the modern anthropologists, not all of them, but many, Oh, these were all, this was all hype. This was all nonsense. Well, why then when we, Richard Shaw, who passed away several years ago now, we went back to Catalina after I published the book. Mm -hmm. And there in the museum is a hit piece on Ralph Glidden. There's the picture that I took of the picture. It's a picture of a picture, except, except they've blown it up. So it's like three feet wide, two feet high. And underneath it is this whole hit piece. We photograph that. And I show that at conferences and people go, 
oh my gosh, they redacted the giant skeleton out of the picture. It's no longer there. And the audience just cracks up. I mean, these are supposedly scientists. Yeah. What are they yeah. so afraid of? It's a managed agenda. Truth is thrown to the street. Instead, they resort to straw man arguments and calling people like me a racist. Yeah. So my my rebuttal to that is, OK, OK, so I'm an Italian American. Mm hmm. OK, mm -hmm. let's just start there. OK, so I'm going to say that, you know, uh, Giuseppe Verdi over in Italy, he's the guy that really invented the airplane. Mm -hmm. OK, mm -hmm. not the Wright brothers. It's Giuseppe. Right. Well, you will say, well, L.A., I'm sorry, but but that's wrong. Giuseppe Verdi did not invent the airplane, the Wright brothers. And if you say that. That's not being a racist. That's speaking the truth. So if I say that Native Americans didn't build the octagon mound because the octagon mound was built on an 18 and a half year lunar cycle and the octagon mound is a complex octagon, it's not just eight equal sides. Two of the sides are unequal. And that octagon uh, encompasses 50 acres. If I say that, then I'm a racist. No, I'm not a racist. I'm just looking for the truth. If Native Americans didn't build it, if Native Americans don't know geometry, and don't give me the nonsense that well, we did it in our heads, you can't do that in your heads. That's complex geometry. You've got to have a compass. You've got to have a ruler. You need to know angles. And if, if you don't know that, then you don't know that. And I'm not being a racist. You know, show me. Show me the deer hide. Show me the buffalo skin with it on. Show me something. Where's the oral tradition? It's not there. Yeah, it's not there. But if you say something against that, oh, you're a racist. This is this is what they resort to. They, they, it's a straw man argument or they call you a racist because, you know, I have a different opinion. So what's the truth? If Native Americans don't know about the 18 and a half year lunar cycle, then they don't know about it. Europeans didn't know about it. Yeah. At first. Yep. So. You know this, and 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 you know if you don't know geometry, I don't know geometry. No, I could I either. could I could I do a, an octagon? I might be able to figure it out, mm -hmm. but you've got to know angles. And you and, and a complex octagon where two of these sides are longer. Now you're looking at advanced geometry. That's why we sat down with with Dottie and and asked her. It's like okay, if. How was this done? And she said, if you came up to me and you showed me this and you said, well, I just kind of looked at the angles and, you know, I just kind of like made this line. She said, well, that would be evidence of cheating. She said, the only way this is advanced geometry. Yeah. You, you need to know angles and protractors and rulers. And it's I mean, you've got to know your stuff. And it's one thing you draw it on a piece of paper. It's another thing to take earth and create a octagon which encompasses 50 acres and by the way we'll be there in 2025 because when you stand on the platform and you look down the causeway and the octagon goes into a circle that's where the lunar standstill happens every 18 and a half years and that moon just sits right in the gate come on guys well, quit lying to us to measure it dig it and and to to look at a straight line and then to yeah I I, I don't know how you do that without advanced machinery, it, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's it's hard to it's hard to imagine. Um. So I I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that. And that's not a racist uh, view either, to be exact. Speaking of geometry, we we talk about um, crop circles as they are. Before we get that, I want to I want to get to a point with with geometry, and then I want to I want to work my way back to the mounds themselves because I was I was trying to make a point about these mounds. Well, maybe I should make a point about the mounds. I, I'm confusing myself here, LA, because I have so much going on in this head here. Um. Let me make a point about the mound. And that was my alternate theory, which I teased as we were going into break. As I'm sitting and I'm watching your film and, and the wonderful panel that you've put together during this film, because you go back and forth between the evidence that you're, you're, you know, you're, you're going through and then you're talking back and forth with the panel you've, uh, you've put together. Um, I'm watching this. I'm watching these mounds and I'm thinking, you know, we're always thinking about, what it is that is driving what's coming at us from space and what it is exactly, what these beings are. And we've heard the classic, well, it's this being, this being, this being. Like we, we know what it is, even though have we really had contact with it or not? 
Um, some people have, some people haven't. I think the people who haven't go along with the people who have and just go along with it and say they, you know, well, we know. Yeah, sure. Um, but then you bring up some interesting evidence of crop circles actually being made and you ask yourself, well, is it really what we think we know what it is? I know I'm talking in circles again. Um, but in those circles that I'm talking, I'm looking at this mound and I say to myself, okay, if it's not a Nephilim body that's in that mound, could it potentially be a battery or a power station that's in that mound? Could it be that although you may have a grave in that mound, if you have something so powerful that it's making this crop circle, obviously whatever's making that crop circle has to have has to have some sort of you would think energy source if they don't already have energy, right? Am I off the off base on this? You just tell me if I'm rambling. No, no, point. not at all. When we were in, and this is, goes back to 2013, 2014, Richard Shaw and I are in Cusco, 12,000 feet above sea level. And we had been touring with Brian Forrester, uh, Saxe Romano, Anton Tabo, other sites, looking at all these megaliths. And we had a cosmic download together. That's never happened to me mm -hmm. with another person exactly at the same time. And we realized what we were looking at was an ancient grid system. Okay. It was an ancient grid system that was over the planet. I believe it was pre-flood. Okay. It was all destroyed. And that's why we see the vestiges of it at Saksiwaman, Oyotentambo, and other places. And then it changes. The entities who came and created that no longer are doing that. So we're out of the, the pristine cut stones that we see at Saksiwaman, Oyotentambo, other places like mm -hmm. that. And then it goes into these megaliths and menhirs and standing stones and, and like like Karnak, but the stonework is not the same. And then from there it goes into the mound builders. And then and what's interesting is all this just vanishes. Yeah. And this is something I'm working on because on all these different sites, wherever you go, it's always the same story. Whether you're in Sardinia, Israel, Karnak, France, England, the Americas. Peru, Mexico, it's always the same thing. Mm -hmm. Well, the Teotihuacanos in Mexico, they built these pyramids, and then they just vanished. They just assimilated back into the, the population. Well, yeah, America Stonehenge was built about 4,000 years ago, roughly, and we don't know what happened to them. Oh, yeah, the mound builders were here, and, and they just assimilated back into the Native American culture, but the Native American culture has no world tradition of that. Well, yeah, in Peru, the oldest city in the Americas, Corral, it's about 5,000 years old, and we, they, I, they just all disappeared. So let me get this straight. There's no pre-existing culture in Peru, which is responsible for building these step pyramids like we see at Corral. Um, where did they all go? Right. So right. They, over and over and over and over and over again again and i have a theory which i won't say but i have a theory about this and um i find it very very interesting and it does tie back into the biblical narrative because one thing you say i i will tell this much about the movie the one thing that you do say about the mound at wiltshire which triggers us in my mind is that they won't let anybody go near the mound. They won't let anybody on the mound. I can understand preserving the mound and want, not wanting people to traipse all over it, especially if it's a grave site. I get that. But there's more to it than that. It seems like it's not being treated as an ancient site out of respect. It's almost like they fear it because there may be something more underneath it, more than just a grave site. It's almost treated out of a healthy respect or fear like like almost like you treat a nuclear site you know like oh don't go near it don't go on it don't go by it just woo, stay away you know everything is controlled everything yeah i mean it's a controlled managed narrative managed agenda as the late chuck messler used to call it it's it's what it is yeah. And, you know, when you go down to Peru and you hear the, the goofy docents who are there, the tour guides, oh, the Inca were master stone builders. And you just want to just want to go quit lying to the people. Yeah. You know, stop, stop it. Inca could not build this. We can't build it today in modernity. Mm -hmm. And some of these stones are 80, 90, 100 tons. How are they moved? Oh, well, just keep moving here, L.A. You're being a troublemaker. <laughs> no, I'm just looking for the truth. And, and what we see is that there's this. 
there's a hidden, I say this on my on my Tuesday show, which is on a trail of a Nephilim every week. Mm -hmm. There is a hidden history that's been deliberately obfuscated from the peoples of the world in this circles all the way back to our very first five minutes, where you go, why is it that these people are afraid of this? And it's the same thing. There's if there's a supernatural world, then the Darwinian paradigm buckles and just falls of its own weight. And of course, there is a supernatural world. Yeah. And it's manifesting. And that's why we do the Monday and Friday shows, supernatural confrontations, where people come on and talk about their supernatural confrontations. Right. So, you know, that's what we're looking at. Um let, it's unbelievable. Let me ask you this, LA. Uh so when we talk about the actual crop circle itself, we talk about the very simple beginnings of them in 1600 how simple they were we go to modern day and how complex they've become in their pattern in their design in their in their geometric makeup and you you come up with a very eloquent uh way of putting it that the language in which you're trying to communicate you call it the secret language of the dragon uh, can you explain to people what that means, or should they look at the movie and figure it out? Well, I mean, I, you, you need to watch the movie, folks. Okay. I mean, just okay. you know, spend five dollars, go to our streaming site, spend five dollars, and 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 learn something. I mean, you know, it's just, it's just amazes me. Can we it, want it for free, LA. Sure. We want it for free. Well, you know what? You're not going to get it for free. Can I can I throw you an alternate theory to your to yeah, your movie yeah, as to what I think these crop circles? I got to get, go, gotta get sure, going yep. here soon. We're at yep, the yep. twenty four minute mark, so sure. But, um, you know, let's wrap it up. But go ahead. Let me th after watching your movie, I, I I have an alternate theory as to what these crop circles may be. Even though the the message becomes more and more intricate throughout time. To me, it almost seems like, and I know you, you say there's only so many different races of aliens out there that are maybe making contact. I come up with almost a street mentality when it comes to this. It seems to me like these aliens are tagging things like street gangs. You know how you have individual members of street gangs and they have their own tag and right, they sure. tag bridges and things like that. To me, it almost looks like these individual patterns maybe a message. And at the end, they put a signature on it. And it's almost like an intergalactic tag, for lack of a better term. They're putting the message in there. And in the message, they have their own signature. Now, I won't spoil anything about the movie. There's one particular thing that you decode in there that is so eerie, it makes me it makes it look like it's a revenge message. It, it very much looks like a revenge message. So I will tell people, go watch this movie. It is it is fascinating. There's a lot of information in there that you should uh, glean from it. And it will make you think about when you look up in the sky and wish you could make contact with one of these things. I don't think, think twice. <laughs> yeah, think twice, because I think there's a, a different agenda there. The name of the movie is Crop Circles, Exposing the Secret Language of the Dragon. L.A. Marzuli is our guest. L.A. Marzuli.net is the uh, website. We'll have a, a link in the description of this program. We'll also have a link to the podcast, so you can check out L.A.'s podcast as well. L.A., I want to thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks, Tim. God bless you, sir, and uh, we'll have you. to do it again soon. Absolutely. God bless you, sir, and uh, thank you very much for joining us. You got it. Take care. Yep. We want to thank Ellie Marzulli for stopping by today and talking about crop circles and what potentially is in them. Again, we want you to check out that brand new movie uh, by L.A. Marzulli, which is called Crop Circles Exposing the Secret Language of the Dragon. It's available on LAMarzulli.net. There's lots of stuff in there, folks, including one particular frame where you actually see a crop circle being made. That's all I'll say. I won't say what's making it or how it's made, but it's not being made by anything earthly. It's pretty fascinating. So go ahead and check that out, lamarzuli.net. There's also a link in the description of this program if you can't remember that, uh, but go ahead and, and check that out. It's uh, it's part of the UFO Disclosure Series, Part 5 on L.A. Marzuli's site. Pretty, pretty fascinating stuff. I'll, I'll put it that way. Before we leave you today, I got an interesting article sent to me by the Genie Help Me site, geniehelpme.com. And I figured I'd pass it along to you on this Thursday before we leave you for the weekend. 
Just an interesting thing. It says ghost ghouls and Google searches. Which states are most enthralled by haunted houses? Figured I'd pass this along as an extra from our news segments on Wednesday. It says, imagine as you walk down a dimly lit hallway, a chilling draft runs down your spine and you can't help but feel an eerie presence lurking in the shadows. The floorboards creak beneath your feet and you hear the distant wail of a tormented soul. There's something both terrifying and thrilling about the unknown and haunted houses have long captured our imaginations, drawing us in with their spine tingling allure. What's actually interesting about this article is it's about to tell you exactly which states are most enthralled with haunted houses. It's not exactly who you would think. I'll let you know more here. It also asks the question, have you ever wondered which states in the U.S. are most intrigued by the spine-tingling abodes? In this report, we dive deep into the world of haunted houses to determine which states are the most captivated by these eerie establishments. Through extensive research, we meticulously analyzed data from Google Keyword Planner to uncover where the interest in haunted houses is the greatest. Again, this comes from GenieHelpMe.com. Their approach takes into account not only the search volume for haunted house-related keywords, but also their growth over the past 12 months as they unveiled their findings Prepare yourself for a few surprises that might just make you question the supernatural affinity of your own state, depending on where you live, that is. I don't think you'll be surprised by the number one, that's for sure. Are you ready to step into the dark corners of America's haunted house fascination? Well, here we go. Let's uh, step into it, shall we? First of all, here's a step-by-step -step breakdown of their methodology as they did this. Keyword collection was first. They collected haunted house-related keywords using Google Keyword Planner for each U.S. state with a focus on the past 12 months. I think this was of 2022. Uh, those keywords included phrases like haunted house near me, horror house near me, and real haunted houses near me. On average, they gathered 50 to 60 keywords per state. There was keyword filtering involved to ensure that they captured the true intent of users. They carefully filtered the keywords according to their relevance on the topic. And there was a haunted point system to rank states based on their interest in haunted houses. Uh, they developed a weighted point system called Haunted Points. This system takes into account both the keyword search volume and the growth in search volume over the past three months. Also, there were keyword search volume points. They assigned points to each keyword based on its search volume, ranging from one point for search volumes between 0 and 10, up to seven points for search volumes exceeding 1 million. I won't give you the exact points because I don't want to bother you with details. There were also growth in search volume points, so they assigned points based on the percentage growth in search volume over the past three months, ranging from one point in growth between zero to 100% and up to eight points for growth exceeding 100,001%. So you could tell this thing is quite weighted based on, you know, searchability. <laughs> The final ranking, they combine the points from search volume and the growth to calculate. The, it's very geeky in here, isn't it? It's getting very geeky right now. Uh, they finally combine the points from search volume and growth to calculate the final haunted points from each state, allowing them to rank the states in order of their interest in haunted houses, which is probably the most important thing, to be honest with you. By following this robust and well-structured methodology, they finally were able to confidently present their findings. That's good because they have too many search measures uh, in a way that is both reliable and engaging uh, for, well, for me, the reader, I guess, and for you, the listener. Here we go. Shall we go from, uh, we'll go from the least amount of points to the most. So we'll go from, I think this is number 10 to number one. Uh, number 10 would be New Mexico, the Enchanted Eerie, as they call it. They got 38 points. With its unique blend of Native American, Spanish, and American frontier history, New Mexico is a hotbed of supernatural legends. It seems the land of enchantment has captivated its residents with the mystique of haunted houses and the spirits that dwell within. Uh, number nine was Indiana which they're calling the Hoosier haunting. 
who's your daddy, I guess. <laughs> that sounded weird. Uh, that was a very bad Jack Nicholson impression, by the way. 39 points for Indiana. Indiana's rich history has given rise to countless ghost stories and haunted locations. The residents of the Hoosier State are eager to explore the dark corners of their past and uncover the chilling tales that lie within. Number eight was Kansas, the Sunflower Specter. They got 40 points on this deal. Amidst the plains of Kansas, there's more than just wheat and wind. Uh, there's a fascination with haunted houses that grips the state. The residents of Kansas are eager to delve into the paranormal stories and the unexplained phenomena that surrounds them. Number six is Maine, the Pine Tree Paradox. They got 41 points. Despite its picturesque landscapes, Maine has a haunting history that seems to have captured the attention of its residents. From the eerie tales of Stephen King novels to the chilling legends of coastal hauntings, Mainers, Mainers are intrigued by the unknown. If you're from Maine and actually call yourself a Mainer, send me an email, Tim at darknessradio.com. That seems like a weird way to call yourself. I don't think Maine people call themselves Mainers. That sounds like it. If you're the lead singer from Tool, maybe you call yourself Mainers. Uh, but other than that, I don't think so. Illinois and New Jersey tied at 43 points. They're the spooky twins, it says here. The two states share an equal fascination with haunted houses as their residents are eager to explore the ghostly tales and spine-chilling stories that lie behind the walls of their local haunted attractions. California, the Golden Ghost State, is next with 45 points. Known for its sun-kissed beaches and Hollywood glamour, California also has a dark side. Californians are drawn to the chilling tales of haunted houses and the supernatural entities that lurk within. Pennsylvania is up next with 48 points. Uh, steeped in American history, Pennsylvania is a treasure trove of ghost stories and haunted locations. Its residents seem captivated by the idea of exploring the spine-chilling sites scattered throughout the state. New York Comes in at number two, The Empire of Erie. Somehow that doesn't surprise me. Uh, from the haunted mansions of the Hudson Valley to the ghostly tales of New York City, the Empire State is no stranger to the supernatural. It seems New Yorkers are eager to unlock the mysteries hidden within their own haunted history. Number one might shock you a little bit, but it doesn't shock me at all. It's Alabama. The terrifying titan, the heart of Dixie takes the crown as the state's most entranced by haunted houses with its rich history of civil war battles and ghostly legends. It's no wonder that Alabamians are drawn to the eerie allure of haunted abodes. I guess it doesn't shock me because I hear a lot of people from Alabama talking about rich ghost history and the fact that I know a lot of people from Alabama that research the paranormal. So it doesn't shock me. Alabama is your number one state when it comes to searching for haunted houses online. So there you go. We'll do, uh, we'll do some more stuff like this in the future. We'll just give you a little bit of an idea as to what uh, people are looking for. You know what? I think on Wednesday's show of next week, we'll talk about AI anxiety, the top 20 professions bracing for the robot takeover. Maybe. You never know. <laughs> Maybe we'll do an AI anxiety deal. Who knows? I want to thank you guys for listening this week and uh, very much. We appreciate each and every listener that's out there. We love you. We, we cherish you, appreciate you. Uh, myself, Bruiser, uh, Mally, and Jess, we, we appreciate your listenership. I want to remind you not to sit on these programs for too long. Please listen within a week or two of getting this download. It helps us as far as uh, if so-called quote-unquote ratings, if that works, downloads, they quote uh, – for us as far as audio boom goes and as far as advertising goes uh, our advertisers don't want to come back and advertise with us if you're not listening to this program on a timely basis and it also helps us as far as numbers go uh, if you're not listening to us within a couple of weeks it doesn't count towards a monthly number and it actually hurts us if you're listening to the show if you're binging a month month and a half later it doesn't doesn't help us at all so uh, we'd appreciate it if you get this show and listen to it. Uh, we, we'd greatly appreciate that. Got a great week of shows ahead for you next week. Again, if you have a guest idea that you would like us to pursue, give me an email, tim at darknessradio.com. Would love to hear 
who you would like to hear on this show. Also give us a little bit of a lead. If you have an idea of how to get a hold of that person, include that in the email as well. Also, we'd like to hear your parish share stories. Tim at darknessradio.com or go to darknessradioshow.com. Leave a voice note. You can do that. Just click that blue button on the right-hand side of the page at darknessradioshow.com. You can leave your voice note. You got a two-minute window there to leave that. It's a two-minute uh, loop that you can leave that voice note. If you need more time, just click that blue button. Again, I'll stitch them together and we'll play your voice note here on the show Uh, if you want us to weigh in let us know that you want us to weigh in as well if you're wanting our opinions really really badly let us know a reminder to take care of yourself and each other folks do yourself a kindness do somebody else out there a kindness and remember to give it's good for the soul it makes the soul feel good it makes somebody else feel good if you have time this weekend do a quick favor for maybe a friend or a neighbor that isn't doing so well Pick them up and and do something like mow a lawn or help somebody out with a a physical task that they can't handle. Maybe there's somebody out on the street down on their luck. Maybe they need five bucks or a meal. Give somebody a meal. That helps more than anything. Today's society, things aren't getting cheaper. I know we're all struggling. We're all having a tough time out there, but some more than others. Let's leave things a little bit better than what we found it. It's just the basic human thing to do. And just a nice thing... And a nice reminder from us, your buddies here at Darkness Radio. Not trying to beat you over the head with anything, but, you know, we we like to remind our buddies to be nice, too, because we like to be nice. We wish you a happy weekend. Go out and have some fun. We're going to go out and have some fun as well. We'll see you next week for another great week of the best in paranormal programming. This is Darkness Radio.